G. Woodson was an African-American writer and historian known as the father of black history. Born in 1875 in New Canton, Virginia, Woodson was the second African-American to receive a doctorate from Harvard University. One of his famous quotes, those who have no record of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration which comes from the teaching of biography and history is an inspiration for celebrating Black History Month, which he began as an observance in 1926. And since that time, since 1976, Black history is celebrated during the entire month of February. The City of Raleigh Museum has amazing exhibits. And as part of this Black History celebration, on Saturday, February 3rd, several local organizations offered historical presentations to celebrate their contributions and significant influences made in Raleigh, the state, and the nation. Father Jamon Taylor, the rector of St. Ambrose Episcopal Church, had a powerful presentation about the church's history and its contributions in our community. This year, St. Ambrose celebrates its 150th anniversary. Father Taylor walked us through the church's life, starting with its first location not too far from the City of Raleigh Museum in downtown Raleigh, all the way to its current location in Southeast Raleigh. Well, thank you all for sticking around for the second program in today's uh, symposium. Um, and this is a, a, an incredible opportunity for us, because again, we, we mentioned earlier this morning, uh, we oversee operations at the Pope House Museum, which is at 511 South Wilmington Street. And right next door to um, Dr. Pope's house, it was St. Ambrose Church until 1965. And so we, the, the history of the Pope family is so linked to this church. And we were so excited to, to, to call in St. Ambrose and to, to work with them, not only their exhibit coming up here in September, but how can we be a better partner in trying to celebrate uh, the Pope House, which is, again, an incredible story. And so our next speaker um, is, is truly an example of when you can see that God has touched the heart of somebody and really changed their life direction. And so our next speaker, speaking of the history of St. Ambrose, is uh, Father Germond Taylor who's the 11th rector at St. Ambrose Church. Uh, Father Taylor grew up in St. Matthias uh, Episcopal Church in Lewisburg. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from North Carolina State, a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering with a concentration in Robotics and Vehicle Design from Stanford University. So here's, here's where the turn comes in. <laughs> so uh, John worked as an Automotive Performance Design Engineer for Michelin Tire Company in Greenville, South Carolina. So then it happened. He, for three years, he worked at that job until God came down and said, you're in the wrong job. <laughs> so he joined the seminary and earned his Master's of Divinity from the General Theological Seminary in the Episcopal Church in New York City in 2009. That same year, he was ordained as a deaconate of the priesthood. Prior to arriving at St. Ambrose, Father Taylor served as a priest in St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church in Dallas, Texas, as a part of the Lilly Foundation Fellowship, in addition to his responsibilities at St. Michael. Jamon's ministry encompasses the Jubilee Park and St. Philip's School, and he lives in Raleigh with Kirsten Lee Taylor, his wonderful wife. So please help me welcome Jamon Taylor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to thank uh, Mr. Ernest Dollar for inviting me to tell St. Ambrose's story. And I entitled this presentation, A Church on the Move. Uh, that is both literal and uh, metaphorically because we have moved several times and we continue to be on the move in the community. I start off with this picture, actually a painting by Hale Woodruff Opening day at Talladega College, 1867, which is in Alabama. Now, this was painted in the 40s, so it actually wasn't painted during the time of the first day of registration. But 1867 is an important date for St. Ambrose, because St. Ambrose's beginning is with St. Augustine's University. And St. Augustine's University was founded in 1867, and St. Ambrose, 1868. So I imagine that the first day of registration at St. Augustine's University 
was maybe something like this. People who were once enslaved, registering, bringing any number of things. You can see a plow there. You can see someone carrying a burlap bag. Who knows what's in it? Maybe this is this gentleman's all the possessions that he owns. But whenever I see this painting, which happens to hang at St. Augustine's University, I think this must have been the genesis of perhaps many of the historically black colleges and universities that were founded around this time. Our founder was the Reverend Jacob Britton Smith, Doctor of Divinity. Very interesting man. He was born in Kentucky. He then went to seminary in New York City at the General Theological Seminary, the seminary I attended, and then became rector of a church in Newark, New Jersey. After the Civil War, he was very active in the Freedmen's Commission that was a part of the Episcopal Church. And one of the goals of the Freedmen's Commission was to help educate those recently emancipated people of African descent. He accepted the bishop's call to come to Raleigh, North Carolina, where he was rector of Christ Church, uh, the church in downtown Raleigh, and also would help lead classes at St. Mary's School. St. Mary's School is an Episcopal school. Christ Church is an Episcopal church. And his position as rector of Christ Church in 1867, he founded St. Augustine's University, the university to educate and by extension, what eventually would become St. Ambrose Episcopal Church for spiritual nourishment. So education of the mind, university, and then church for spiritual nourishment. This is a snippet from the North Carolina Legislative Act of 1868. So by an act of the General Assembly, 1868 to 1869, Chapter Law 51, these five individuals who are trustees were granted use of a certain lot at the corner of Lane and Dawson Streets. If you know where the Round Holiday Inn is downtown, this plot of land is just a little bit north. I think there is a Days Inn motel across the street. It's where the Melrose Mill uh, restaurant and location is now. But the General Assembly said that the trustees could use that plot of land for 99 years for the operation of a parochial school under the auspices of St. Augustine's Chapel, which later became St. Ambrose's Church. The significance of this is that it shows some collaboration between government and religious life. Now, the five men listed here were once members of Christ Church. So the founding of St. Ambrose occurred when 10 members or 10 families from Christ Church Raleigh removed their membership from that church and then joined this church by extension of St. Augustine's University, St. Augustine's Chapel. So February 11th, 1868 is our founding. St. Augustine University was organized in 1867, and actually the first class was admitted January 1868, and then on February 11th of that year, which happened to be a Tuesday, St. Augustine's Chapel, which would later be known as St. Ambrose Church, was organized by the diocese under Jacob Britton Smith, and that the clergy who served that church were the rector of Christ Church, and also Father Smeeds, who at that time had directorship of St. Mary's School. This year, February 11th, 2018, is on a Sunday. So we think it's providential that the exact anniversary, our 150th anniversary, is on a Sunday. And so we're having a combined worship service, which will be a week from tomorrow, at St. Augustine's Chapel on campus where St. Ambrose will be attending, St. Augustine's obviously will be attending because it's on their locale, and also Christ Church, choir members, uh, church leaders, all three communities, which is the genesis of St. Ambrose, will be worshiping on February 11th. One of the reasons I enjoy coming to the City of Raleigh Museum is the map on the left when you enter. I don't know if any of you have 
paid attention to that map, but that map is from 1872 uh, by C.N. Dree, and it shows a bird's eye view of Raleigh, a map of Raleigh uh, from 1872. It, it makes me wonder how he did that. This, was, this would almost be a drone shot or a drone picture today, but there was no drone in 1872. But somehow, uh, C. Andre, because of his skills with the paintbrush, was able to paint this map. And so when you walk into the City of Raleigh Museum on your left, there is this map writ large. It's probably some 15 feet wide and maybe uh, 10 feet tall. Well, in the mid-left portion of that map, the part that I have encircled there is St. Ambrose Church. So that means this is the earliest rendering we have of our congregation at the corner of Lane and Dawson Streets. And this is a zoomed in image from that map. And when you look at the ledger for the map, it says the colored Episcopal Church. So the colored Episcopal Church in 1872 when this map was painted uh, was at that time known as St. Augustine's Chapel, eventually to become St. Uh, Ambrose Church. Those of you who know Raleigh well know that that location is about a mile west of St. Augustine's campus. The students would receive lecture on campus and then Sunday mornings walk that one mile west to this chapel. So the chapel was removed geographically from the school. 1879 was another important date in the history of the congregation because before that time, St. Augustine's Chapel or St. Ambrose Church was not officially organized. People met there to worship, but the way the Episcopal Church works is that for a congregation to be officially recognized or welcomed into the diocese, it takes an act of convention, which meets once a year. So at the convention that convened in 1789, the diocese adopted a resolution to admit St. Augustine's as a parish. Now that's significant because other Southern dioceses had separate designation for black congregations. So a black congregation could be admitted to the diocese, but it was in a, a black convocation or had a separate designation that really didn't have adequate voice and vote at convention. But North Carolina was different. Uh, St. Ambrose was brought into the family of, in the Episcopal diocese with voice and vote and without a separate designation. That same year, 1879, uh, the Reverend George A.C. Cooper died. Now, perhaps you've never heard of uh, the Reverend George A.C. Cooper, but you've heard of his wife, Anna Julia Haywood Cooper. So they were married um, in 1876 at St. Uh, Ambrose Church. Um, and he was vicar of the church. That means he had religious oversight uh, from 1876 until his untimely death in 1879. Anna Julia Cooper never remarried, but certainly one of the shining lights um, in the United States and the world. A little nugget, uh, Anna Julia Cooper is considered a saint in the Episcopal Church. Uh, so we refer to her as Saint Anna Julia Cooper. Her day that we celebrate is February 28th. Um, and so each year we go to her grave site we offer prayers and then we go to uh, St. Ambrose and have a worship service where we read scripture that pertain to her life. We read special prayers that pertain to her life and then we receive Holy Communion. I think St. Ambrose is blessed because not only is she a saint from the church recognized by the Episcopal Church worldwide, but also um, the right Reverend Henry Beard Delaney. I will talk about him later. He is also a saint in the Episcopal Church, Saint Henry Beard Delaney, and we do some of the same things uh, for him that we do for Anna Julia Cooper. We visit his uh, grave site. His day happens to be in April. I just talked about Henry Beard Delaney. Another important date in the history of St. Ambrose is a new name. So in 1896, we received a new name. That same year, 
uh, Henry Beard Delaney, who at that time was a priest in the Episcopal Church and a very gifted man. If you don't know a lot about Bishop Delaney, certainly go to St. Augustine's University. Um, after this talk, you're welcome to look at the artifacts. We have the chalice from 1892 that was presented to him as his ordination present uh, to the peace, uh, priesthood. But Delaney was a remarkable man born an enslaved person entering St. Augustine's University, studying for holy orders, then becoming a priest, and later the first black bishop in the Diocese of North Carolina in 1918. But in addition to his religious work, he was a great musician, had a wonderful voice, a dynamic preacher, but he was also a skilled mason. So he helped quarry rocks from the campus of St. Augustine's and built the chapel. You know, the chapel is a stone chapel, and it mirrors St. Agnes Hospital, which during its heyday was the only um, black hospital, I would say large black hospital for African Americans between DC and New Orleans. Also that hospital is the same year, 1896. Well, as Bishop Delaney, as he would be known in the future, finished the chapel, you then had a brand new chapel that was on campus. You remember before I said students had to walk a mile west to the chapel. Now there's a chapel on campus. It's brand new. It's made of stone. So you have St. Augustine's Chapel on campus and then St. Augustine's Chapel off campus. That's very confusing. I'm going to St. Augustine's. Which one are you going to? Are you going to the stone one or are you going to the wooden one? So in that year, Bishop Cheshire recommended that the chapel formerly known as St. Augustine's Chapel, that wooden chapel that's on the map uh, as you enter the city of Raleigh Museum, that that church have a new name and be known as the Church of St. Ambrose. So St. Ambrose, as I said, has its genesis in St. Augustine's. It was formerly St. Augustine's Chapel, but in 1896, we adopted a new name, St. Ambrose Church. A little bit about the connection between the individuals. Augustine was an African who lived in the late 300s, early 400s. He was very instrumental in what we call Western Christianity. A lot of the theology and the way we think as Christians in the West, even though he was African, comes from St. Augustine. Well, St. Augustine did not grow up a Christian. Uh, his mother, Monica, prayed for years that her son would become a Christian. It wasn't until Augustine was in Milan, France, when he heard a bishop named Ambrose preach. And after sitting under Ambrose for maybe a num number of months, he was baptized on Easter Day. So you can see the connection both historically and literally. It's not just happenstance that the bishop decided to name the former St. Augustine's Chapel, St. Ambrose. Because in history, St. Ambrose religiously had an impact on St. Augustine, the person. And in this day, I think Bishop Cheshire was thinking that St. Ambrose's congregation would have an impact on the teaching of St. Augustine's students. Scripture says, get knowledge, get understanding, seek wisdom, and you will find her. Yes. Is he related to the Delaney sisters? Yes, he is the father of the Delaney sisters. Oh, right. That's right, from having our say. 1897. The General Assembly authorized the trustees in that year to sell the property at Lane and Dawson Streets to the highest bidder. And so the trustees sold the property to Melrose Mill, which the building still exists. Um, this was in the Smoky Hollow neighborhood, and purchased land at Wilmington and Cabarrus Streets, where the Pogue Tobacco Warehouse once stood. So not that long after the church's founding in 1868, and feeling settled, we got a new name, uh, we had a new priest at that time named Deacon King, you, you, you imagine that you really want to put down roots, but the General Assembly said, you got to get up and go. So, 
In 1900, St. Ambrose was a church on the move. I'm still searching for an image of St. Ambrose moving. Until I find that image, this Presbyterian church will have to do. <laughs> so in 1900, this picture is from 1903, this is how they would move churches with rollers and skids. You simply jack the church up, slide items under it, rollers and skids, um, and then use either by beast or by machine something to pull the church. And so St. Ambrose moved a mile south from Lane and Dawson to the corner of Wilmington and Cabrera Streets, which is near Shaw University. Willie O.D.K., who was a member of St. Ambrose, she was born in 1896, remembers being four years old and running home to sit on her grandmother's front porch. And she talks about as a four-year-old watching the church roll down the street, roll down the street, rolling down um, Fayetteville Street. In the interim, as the church was moving, we worshiped at the old Metropolitan Hall, which I think is only a few doors down. I think it was at 227 Fayetteville Street. So we worshiped there for six months. And then in December of 1900, we were at our new location. The tobacco warehouse had been torn down. A new basement had been built. And so we rolled this church right over the basement. And we were in a new location. It's the old Metropolitan Hall. So new, no, new location, new basement. This is a picture taken by, uh, at that time, the venerable Henry Beard Delaney. He was archdeacon for colored work in the Diocese of North Carolina. The building that's prominent in the center is the schoolhouse. To the right is the back of St. Ambrose Church. And then the basement is below. These images are from 1912. So with this new location came a new focus, new, new focus on education. And so even in St. Ambrose's beginning, you remember from the Legislative Act that the first thing was mentioned was a parochial school, again, education. The image on the left, we have students. I wish I had the names of these students. Students from the kindergarten. And then on the right, a picture of the church and school building. St. Ambrose had one of only four kindergartens in the state of North Carolina at that time. And also our parochial school had 180 students. You remember, during this time, there really was no public, not really, there was no public education for black people. And so the churches picked up the mantle, the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church. So St. Ambrose, doing its part, was educating 180 students. Uh, I did some analysis. I think at that time, we were educating maybe uh, 10 to 20 percent of the students in Raleigh, black students. So quite an impact this church was having on the city of Raleigh. We stayed at that location until 1865. I mentioned that when we moved to Wilmington and Cabrera Streets, that there was a basement. Many things happened in that basement. We just had a, a lecture from Delta Sigma Theta. In that basement, uh, Zeta Phi Beta, the local chapter, had its beginning in the, basis of, in the basement of St. Ambrose Church on Wilmington and Cabrera Streets. Also, we did Sunday school education. We held community meetings but also there were roller skating parties that we held in the basement. Uh, a few people here, Ms. Edna Rich Ballantyne, who, who is a Delta and also a very faithful member of St. Ambrose, remembers growing up, putting on her roller skates and roller skating around the basement and grabbing the pole so she could whip around the corner and get a lot more speed. This is our 150th anniversary, and the first event that we had a couple of weeks ago was a roller skating party at United Skates of America. And Ms. Edna is our anniversary chair, and she put on roller skates and did her thing. Uh, I won't tell you her age, you can ask her, but I was most impressed to see Ms. Edna on skates. Not only did we have roller skating parties, but also um, regular parties for teenagers. During the 40s, 50s, and 60s, 
there were not many places for teenagers to go, especially black teenagers. And so the rector in the 40s, Father Thompson, said, well, let's have parties in the basement. Now, this was a time when many Christians believed that the sacred and the secular don't mix. If you are a true Christian, you don't listen to jazz, you don't listen to blues or R&B, you listen to church music. Matter of fact, you listen to hymns. And you certainly don't play jazz, blues, and R&B in the church. Well, Father Thompson played Jew, uh, jazz, blues, and R&B in the basement of the church. And we have a member of our congregation who tells a story. He was a teenager in Raleigh, not affiliated with any church in particular. And he went to a party at St. Ambrose. So he gets home and his mother says, son, where have you been? Well, I was at a party at the church, St. Ambrose. Well, what were they playing? Oh, they were playing these musicians. And then the mother has a very confused look on her face. Well, where was, where was the pastor? He was the DJ. <laughs> but this was a means of evangelism. We have people today, faithful members of St. Ambrose, whose introduction to Jesus Christ was in the basement roller skating or listening to whatever jazz musician or blues singer was popular during that time. And they are faithful members even today. So we stayed at that location. We had already moved once. And in 1865, the building was in need of serious repair. And so we raised the building and tore it down. Many were sad to see this building go. We have some things that remain from that original structure. One is the altar. We have the altar that's in our church from the 1868 structure. Uh, we also have some crosses, some candle stands that we brought from that church to our new location. When we tore down the church on Wilmington and Cabarrus Streets, we were again homeless. So this was our second time being homeless. The first time we were homeless, when we picked up and moved to church and worshiped at Metropolitan Hall. This time we had no church per se, and so we worshiped in the new Fuller Elementary School building in the auditorium. And so these are pictures from the groundbreaking. The top left is the procession. You can see the cross in the foreground. I brought that cross. It's on display. That cross dates back to 1898. Following the cross from Fuller down to our current locale on, uh, in the Rochester Heights neighborhood, the groundbreaking top right, beginning with prayers, and in the middle, we have the rector during that time, the Reverend Arthur Calloway, breaking ground. The bishop is to his right, and then a the gentleman in the middle is uh, John Kay, I believe. So we move to Rochester Heights. So Rochester Heights was the first neighborhood zoned by the city of Raleigh for black people to live during segregation, 1957. And so since black people were moving to Rochester Heights, St. Ambrose decided to move to Rochester Heights. What is interesting about the location is that it sits in a wetland on Walnut Creek. That area was where the city of Raleigh dumped raw sewage for about 70 years, and then trash for about 40 years. So as my mentor from Philadelphia says, you dump sewage, you dump garbage, and then you dump Negroes. And so this is where we moved. Originally, St. Ambrose wanted to be on Garner Road, which was a, a major street, uh, but the city of Raleigh didn't want churches on Garner Road, so they put us at the end of State Street, excuse me, Darby Street, which at that time was a dead end road um, in a valley right by the Wetland Center. And I'll come back and revisit that in a little bit uh, to, to tell the significance of our move there. So video from 1963, I want you to listen to the music and I'll talk about that later.
And if y'all know Dennis Davis. All right, thank you. We go to the next slide and video. Now, this is St. Ambrose Episcopal Church when it was located in the, on Wilmington Street in Raleigh, Varus and Wilmington Street. That's Father Thompson, who was the priest in charge of the church. That young man right there is only white. He's the one that you see come over to my house sometimes. He's got a Lincoln, mm -hmm. a tan Lincoln. And he's had a terrible That video was courtesy of Mr. Lemuel Delaney, who passed, uh, I guess, a little over a year ago uh, at age, I think, 98 or 99. So that video was from 1941. We can go back to the slideshow. So the Cochrane Mass, the Cochrane Mass to the Jazz Mass. The music that you heard in the video was from our third rector, the Reverend Arthur Myron Cochrane who um, theologians say was the Quincy Jones of his day because he took Negro spirituals, which were really not that popular in 1919. He took Negro spirituals and meshed it with Episcopal liturgy and wrote music for the different movements as you move through the liturgy, like the glory of the glory to God in the highest, the great amen, the holy, holy, holy. So below is the score for the great amen, which happens right at the end of the communion service. Episcopalians believe that it is at this moment that the body, that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. And so he chose for that piece, swing low, sweet chariot. So to me, that's significant because uh, we know that Elijah from scripture this chariot came down from heaven, swooped up Elijah, and went back. It was the, the coming together of everything heavenly and everything earthly. And so at the end of the communion service, a great amen is the culmination of everything that is heavenly, Jesus Christ, and everything that is earthly. So instead of swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home, amen, amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Theological statement through music. Swing low, sweet chariot becomes the amen at the end of the communion service. So let's talk about the impact of the community over time and then looking forward. I said that education has always been very important to St. Ambrose Church. With the founding of the school, the St. Ambrose School, also, uh, in the early to mid-2000s, we had the new Genius Academy, again, helping educate people, uh, young people in the Rochester Heights neighborhood. Environmental justice. So we moved to Rochester Heights, which is 
in the Walnut Creek wetlands. And the wetlands ideally should work like a bathtub. It should soak up all the water that comes in, storm water, and then filter it through the earth and the different plant life. Well, when the wetlands have not been taken care of, because you dump sewage, you dump garbage, and then you dump Negroes, then the wetland acts like a clogged bathtub. And when a bathtub is stopped up, it runs over. And the equivalent of that is flooding. So there is a lot of flooding, and still is a lot of flooding in Walnut Creek, Rochester Heights. Some people think that the flooding happened a long time ago. It did, and it still happens today. As a matter of fact, our greatest enemy, as it relates to flooding, is all the development that's happening in Cary in North Raleigh. Because when you remove trees and pour down concrete, then that water has to go somewhere. And it comes to St. Ambrose, because we are at the mouth of the Walnut Creek watershed. And the water comes past us, goes to the Neuse River, and then goes to the Atlantic Ocean. So last year, we had to cancel church twice because all the roads around St. Ambrose were flooded. Uh, Ten years ago, we really didn't have to do that. And this is getting worse and worse. So the Walnut Creek Wetland Center, Partners for Environmental Justice, had its beginning at St. Ambrose when Father Calloway uh, when one of our members, Mrs. Curran, said, my basement is flooded again, Father, you need to do something. So he empowered uh, Dr. Norman Camp, who started Episcopalians for Environmental Justice, later Partners for Environmental Justice, and the culminating act of that was the construction of the Walnut Creek Educational Center. They're on Peterson Street, not far from St. Ambrose. And in 2014, uh, some of you perhaps voted for the $92 million bond, that turned the Walnut Creek Center, Wetland Center, into the Walnut Creek Park, a 42-acre park uh, in Rochester Heights neighborhood. So we still continue to fight what I call environmental racism, because that's exactly what it is. Prison ministry. I'm going to read um, an excerpt from a 1906 newspaper. So this ran in the Raleigh Times, December 20th, 1906. Ben Williams, a 28-year-old Negro, was executed yesterday by hanging. In February, Ben Williams and Alex Clark, who both worked at the Seaboard Rail, became infatuated with the same woman. Clark found more favor in the woman's eyes, and Ben Williams grew wildly jealous. Ben Williams shot Alex Clark with a pistol in the front doorway of a downtown house in broad daylight. The Reverend James E. King, rector of St. Ambrose Episcopal Church, met Ben Williams in his jail cell for prayers prior to his execution. Sheriff Sears arrived, reading him the death warranty in a low, quiet tone of voice. The Reverend King, several deputies, and Sheriff Sears proceeded, or actually processed, with Williams to a scaffold of an old-fashioned variety with uprights and a trap door and cross beam from which dangled a linen rope and slip knot. Williams stood on the trap door holding the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer in both hands. After the Reverend King read from the Bible, Williams and King alone repeated the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer together. Then the minister offered prayer. The trap door released. Williams was hanged. About 60 people witnessed the execution, though only 36 tickets had been issued by the sheriff. Williams' dead body was turned over to the undertaker, John Brown, who will prepare it for use in the dissecting room of North Carolina State University, according to the act of the legislature provided for such cases. Father King, the same priest who oversaw the moving of the church, is the one mentioned here, taking time to go and pray with those being executed. Our prison ministry, or involvement with prison ministry, continues. Um, during the 60s, we had men from the correctional facility come and worship at St. Ambrose. And a, a couple of years ago, one of our parishioners taught Christian yoga in the women's correctional facility. I didn't know Christian yoga existed. Um, 
And the phrase that stands out in my mind is that she never met such free thinking people that people outside of prison have a more incarcerated mindset than the women she met in the North Carolina Women's Correctional Facility. Food ministry, um, in the 80s, 90s, and up until about two years ago, we would deliver food to the Helen Wright Center. Mr. and Mrs. James Revis, over those years, um, took 11,000 meals prepared in their home. Helen Wright Center, and in our food ministry that would take food to the homebound, 32,000 people uh, impacted in eight years. Substance abuse, we have two uh, recovery groups that meet at St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose, uh, I think, was the first black congregation in Wake County to allow Alcoholics Anonymous to meet. They've been meeting there 43 years, and we have one of the first Narcotics Anonymous groups that was actually celebrated 30 years, I think, last week. Some new partnerships, you know, it's good to look back, but let's look forward. What's, what's happening now? Um, in the area of worship, we uh, started a theater ministry. The image is from A Raisin in the Sun that uh, we debuted a couple of years ago. And the woman on the right is Esther Delaney, who is the great, great granddaughter of Bishop Delaney. Uh, we have a dance ministry. We have a new partnership in education, One Church, One School. We partner with Fuller Elementary School. We participate in the Habitat for Humanity Bill. The Episcopal Diocese of North Carolina has committed to building 100 Habitat homes, only about two miles from St. Ambrose, so we participate in that. We also continue with the Walnut Creek Wetland Partnership, really studying the watershed and how the building in North Raleigh and Cary is impacting us. And also, we are a part of the Wake County Sponsors, which is a new community organizing initiative that is starting in Wake County. That's been a quick snapshot of 150 years. It's been a good journey. We will be around for 150 more years because St. Ambrose is important not only in the fabric of the city of Raleigh, but in the fabric of people's lives. And I look forward to the future of lifting up the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are there any questions? Yes. Very good. The stained glass windows in St. Ambrose are probably 30 years old. Um, and I marked that because one of my parishioners said that when he bought one, his daughter had just been born. So I know the age of the daughter. So about 30 years. Yes. That's a very good question. Lynn Hoke, if you raise your hand, she's the historiographer for the Diocese of North Carolina. My guess um, is that the school, when St. Augustine's was founded, could not be in the city limits. So if you read the Delaney Sisters book, Having Our Say, she talks about uh, the school being on the outskirts and the white teachers really not leaving campus much because if you got off campus, you may be killed. Um, so the school had to be off campus and then the General Assembly deeded this land at Lane and Dawson Street. So you couldn't build a university on 200 feet by 100 feet parcel of land. So I guess they built the chapel there and then the school was, was off site. That sound correct, Lynn, maybe? Yeah. Probably funding. Educational priorities and everything. Very little funding. They did it for a while, kind of a, a room designated as a sort of a chapel mm -hmm. for you know, some services while they were still going back and forth. But it just took a while. So a hand, is there a hand here? No. Okay, yes. And also, it is important to note that. St. Augustine is located in College Park. College Park was not annexed into the city of Raleigh until 1929. Okay. I'm almost at 11.50, so I'll take one more. And I have to take this one because y'all know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you speak to the significance of the honeycomb? Yes. Yes. So this is our logo for the 150th. St. Ambrose, the individual, the one who's preaching converted, St. Augustine the African, 
was known as the honey tongue preacher. Legend has it that when he was a baby, a honeybee landed on his lips and left honey. Didn't sting, but left honey. And also he was a, such a dynamic preacher, they called him the honey tongue preacher. So when you go to St. Ambrose Church, throughout there's the honey bee symbol, the honeycomb, the beehive. Uh, our young adult ministry has adapted the term the hive. So there are all these echoes of bees. And so you can see the honeycomb pattern in behind, on the back side of the logo. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation, uh, Father Taylor. It, it's wonderful. I love that video footage. There's nothing more incredible to seeing the past come alive and, and see those faces of those people. And so uh, we're going to take a quick break, but I hope you'll stick around because we're going to really take that idea of the, the living, moving image and take it one step further to the 21st century to say how in the 21st century in the next generation are we going to tell black history through technology. So it's going to be an incredible peek into the future. So I hope you all stick around for it, and thank you for coming. Links and ties. All of the presenters threaded the history of their organizations into the life of Raleigh to give visitors a better understanding of their significance in our community and our state. If you would like to know more about upcoming exhibits and events at the City of Raleigh Museum, visit the museum at 220 Fayetteville Street or call 919-996-2220 or visit the website. Thanks and remember the words of Carter G. Woodson. Those who have no record of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration when it comes from teaching biography and history.